Well, thank you, Ms. Vicki. I appreciate that so very, very much. If you turn your Bibles into your Bibles to Galatians chapter 6, we quickly are going through this book. Actually, there's only one more message out of the book of Galatians when we're done today. That will be a few weeks away from now because next week we have a Thanksgiving message and then the first Sunday of December, Pastor Steve uh, will be delivering the message again. And so it'll be the second Sunday of December before we finish up this one wonderful book. The text in front of you, let me read it. Follow along if you would in your word or on the screen. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from the nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. The world in which we live in has unchangeable laws. Absolute laws. Laws that will not and cannot change. In fact, we could not exist if we didn't have certain laws that we couldn't count on. If they weren't constant. One of the evidences that the Bible is true is that when it speaks of science and natural laws, it has always been proven right. The Bible is not only accurate when it talks about science, natural laws, and those kinds of facts, and that it talks about being a universe that is orderly and dependable. The Bible also talks about the fact that we're not an accident. That we are all an act by the knowledge of God. I believe it was Galileo, if I'm quoting the wrong scientist from years gone by, forgive me, but I believe it was Galileo that said the reason he believed in God was due to the fact that the human body was so complex. And he gave an illustration. He said if you were to take ten coins Mark them one through ten, put them in your pocket. The chances of pulling out one the first time was one in ten. He said, but if you were to put that back in your pocket and reach in again and pull out number two next, the percentages mathematically increased. And putting that back in your pocket, pulling out all those numbers, one through ten in perfect order, every time that mathematical equation got this long. And he said, when you look at the human body and you look at the number of complex things that have to work together to make the human body function and keep it working in harmony, it is, statistic, it is absolutely impossible to have that happen by random. I find that it's strange that every discipline of life, every scholar of those disciplines will speak of specific laws that will never change, that are absolute, and we're glad that they don't change. But when it comes to God and His moral absolutes and His ethical laws, there's always people who claim you cannot claim something is absolute. Other areas, we have no problem with calling and talking about absolute laws. But when it comes to what God has to say, there's always much discussion. And that happens even within the church, I hate to say. People often say that the old truths are unnecessary, they're invalid, they're obsolete. Well, truth, real truth, never becomes obsolete. God's truth never changes. It is eternally true. This truth was set forth in an illustration one time about a musician. 
gentleman knocked on his door and said to him one day, what, what is the good news for today? And that musician took out a tuning fork and, and he struck that tuning fork and he said, Sir, that is an A. It has been an A for 5,000 years and will be an A for 5,000 more years. He struck the tuning fork again and he says, My friend, that the man across the hall sings off key. The piano down in the next room is out of tune. The soprano upstairs flats her high notes. But that, as he strikes the tuning fork again, is an A, will always be an A. When we look at truth, and we look at the voices around us that tell us there's truth that we cannot know, tell us that the Word of God is not truth, but let me say, God's Word is truth, absolute. We can depend on it every day and anything else is flat anything else is out of tune we judge our lives we judge how we live based upon the truth of the Word of God Paul to illustrate that truth the absolute laws gives an example of planting sowing reaping and harvest and it's a perfect example, an, under, an example that it, anyone can understand because even if we're not farmers, we plant seeds, we plant flowers, we see things grow. We understand the whole concept of planting, sowing, and reaping. Well, look at some of the things this text has to tell us about those truths. Well, first of all, I noticed he tells us, do not be deceived. Paul earlier in, in, in this book, as he was talking to these people, said, don't be misguided. Uh, and, and in many ways, this is the theme of the book of Galatians. Don't be led astray. Verse 1 of chapter 3 says, who bewitched you? Who came along and got you confused of the truth? There were false teachers in that day, in that age. There are false teachers today. Paul he told us to just be on the lookout for them. 2 Timothy 3.13 says, Evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Jesus made something, a comment very similar in Matthew 24.44. He says, For false teachers and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. So he first here we see, he says, Don't be deceived, don't be misled. We have an enemy called Satan who loves to mislead people. He is a liar. John chapter 4 verse 44 tells us that so clearly that he is the father of lies. In fact, if his mouth is moving, he's telling you a lie. He must have been a politician. Um, he is the biggest liar of all. And he will tell us anything to, to get us to sin. That's what he did with Adam and Eve, was it not? God, God told... Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 2 verse 17 you can eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden with the exception of the tree of good and evil because if you do the day you eat of it you will surely die God told him the consequence of eating of that one tree and Satan came along and said that ain't right God knows what will happen to you and that you will be like him and 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 Adam and Eve were deceived and he, Satan hasn't stopped that. He wants to fool us. And don't be deceived. Don't fool yourself. And we live in an age where people are trying to deceive each themselves and others. You hear it all the time. You can sin and get by with it. Nobody will know what you did. People say, I'm the captain of my own ship. There's no God that I have to answer to. Psalm 10, referring to a wicked individual, says to himself, verse 11, God has forgotten, he covers his face and never sees. The wicked person says, God's not going to look at us. It, we, it doesn't matter what we do. But see, is that not our world in which we live in today? 
Are we not living amongst people who believe they can do with anything they please and are convinced they can get by with it? That God's not got a hope going to hold us accountable for our behavior and our actions and attitudes? One of the reasons I think we come to that conclusion is because God is slow according to His judgment. It goes back to our Bible lesson this morning in, in class. And, uh, is that God in His love continually gives us chance after chance after chance and then one day as someone says that balloon pops and judgment comes. Because God is slow concerning bringing judgment. Some people say we can get by with sin and live in sin. Paul, using this illustration of planting and reaping, would say, don't expect a good crop if your field is full of weeds. Satan will lie to us, he will lie to us, and our hearts will lie to us, because our hearts are deceitful, as the prophet Jeremiah said. The heart of an unsaved individual wants to live in sin, wants to believe Satan's lie. But what he's saying, and the word of God is so clear, that you cannot live in sin and expect to produce a good crop. The next note, words that he uses here is that God is not mocked, if you notice. Some people just think that God's not going to hold them accountable for their sin. You see, talking about the word mock means to be treated lightly or to be taken lightly. It literally means to stick your nose up in the air. When you're mocking God, you're saying, I'm better than God. I'm smarter than God. There's that old saying that says, you can fool some of the people some of the time. You can fool some of the people all of the time. But you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. And I want to add something to that. You cannot fool God any of the time. Paul in this illustration, this time-tested illustration of planting and reaping, brings the point home. There's natural laws of planting and reaping. There's a natural law called gravity that nobody in their mind would get on top of a building and jump off. Because we know the law of gravity. And Paul says the same thing of planting and reaping is the same thing on a spiritual plane, on a moral and ethical plane. When Job was going through his hard time, one of his friends by the name of Eliphaz came along and, and said this to him, As I have observed, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. Because he assumed that the trouble that Job was going through was a result of sin in his life. And that was a, a, a normal, logical assumption. It wasn't the truth, we know, because God was testing Job at that point in time. But, but a law of nature says, if, if you're going to sow evil, you're going to reap it. And so Job's friends told him that. If you were a farmer... You planted corn, you're going to expect to get corn, aren't you? In our lives, if you plant seeds of kindness, you're going to receive kindness back. You plant seeds of discord, you're going to get discord back. You plant seeds of immorality, you're going to get immorality back. You're going to get what you plant. You're going to plant some kind of good, you're going to get good back. You plant some kind of evil, you're going to get evil in return. He compares then the, the sinful nature or the flesh with the spirit. He's saying once you're finished planting something, you cannot change what you've planted. The harvest is going to come back to you with what you planted. And he's saying you're either planting something to the sinful nature or you're planting something to the spirit. He says, if you sow something to that flesh or the sinful nature, you're going to get back destruction, as the New International says here. King James, and some of you have that, it's the word corruption. Uh, it, it, it disintegrates, it's talking about here. The idea is that it decays, that it spoils. 
It's something that gives off a, a, a bad odor. Uh, in, in many ways, he's saying sin will always bring disintegration and make things fall apart. Again, he's saying clearly here to us, don't expect to produce good things if that's not what you're planting. What you and I sow, that's what we're going to get. If we sow anger, don't expect someone to be kind to you. If you sow some type of sin, don't expect to have peace and joy and contentment in your life. John Stott says it so clearly here, so let me just read a couple lines from him. He says, every time we allow our minds to harbor a grudge, nurse a grievance, entertain an impure thought, wallow in self-pity, we're sowing to the flesh. Every time we linger in bad company, every time we resist the Lord, every time we lie in bed and think up things that we ought not do, or sit, and when we lay in bed and don't get up and pray, and every time we read pornography, uh, every time we are not self-controlled, we are sowing, sowing to the flesh. We choose what we sow. And if we sow to the Spirit, we will reap godly things, eternal life. We ought to sow thoughts and actions that are godly. We ought to read books that are pure. We ought to become friends and befriend godly and people in the family of God, which we sang about a moment ago. We ought to choose entertainment that will be uplifting to us. In a some sense, we need to enjoy heaven now because eternal life starts the moment we are born again, not off in the distance someday. We get a taste of heaven, a little bit of taste of heaven right now. He talks about there's going to be a harvest then from what we sow. That's why people farm. They plant a crop to produce income. And they only reap what they sow. Can I say it this way? They actually reap more than what they sow. Because if you take a kernel of corn, put it in the ground, it takes root, it gets a big stalk and around here up to here, or maybe better, and it produces a number of ears on that stalk, and every ear has numerous kernels of corn. It's always corn, but it's a lot more than what's planted. When we reap, when we sow a good crop, we will reap a good harvest. I think one of the nations, one of the problems that we have in this nation right now is that we have sown bad seed, bad, and we're experiencing bad results. We are reaping what we have sown. Over the last 30, 40, 50 years, we have sown seeds in our nation of rebellion. We have sowed seeds of disobedience, all sorts of godlessness and evil. We've sown seeds of dependency upon the government for our livelihood. We have sown seeds of laziness. We have sown seeds of unethical behavior. We have sown seeds of socialism. And we are reaping a crop today of the same. But in the midst of what Paul is saying here, he gives us some words of encouragement. That's always good, isn't it? Words of encouragement. He says, don't give up doing good. We all get tired, don't we? We get exhausted at times. When was the last time you said, why should I even bother anymore? I, I, I look at Cornerstone. We're a wonderful church. But I do not know the last time someone's walked this aisle to profess faith in Christ as Savior. And that bothers me. But I'm not to give up. We're not to get weary. We can say the work is so hard. 
What I'm doing is doing no good. And again, he goes back to the illustration of sowing and reaping. It takes time for the harvest to get ready. We don't plant something on Monday and expect to reap it on Tuesday. Paul is saying as you plant, keep on planting, keep on keeping on, keep on working, keep on being faithful to the Lord. Because someday there will be a crop. Paul writing to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 38 says, Therefore my dear brothers, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. We need to keep remembering that when things don't go the way we would like. The prophet Isaiah, I think, said it very well also in Isaiah chapter 55 verses 10 and 11. He says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. There again is the encouragement that God's word is going to produce a harvest. I love the illustration that comes from my home church, the missionary church. There was a couple by the name of Ummels. They were, the family had just sent numerous missionaries all over the world uh, in, in my home church. And the story goes that they went to Nigeria and for the first eight years of their work there, not one person was converted to Christianity. They had not one convert. But thir 40 years ago, I left the north and moved to the south. And do you know where the largest church in attendance was in the world in 1979 in the missionary church? In Josh, Nigeria. It produced a harvest. He's saying to us here, keep on keeping on. Keep on sowing. Keep on loving people. Keep on rejecting false teaching. Keep on encouraging our brothers and sisters. Keep helping the brother or sister who has fallen as we talked about last time. Keep on preaching and teaching the gospel because someone will respond eventually. Keep on doing good work for the Lord. And that's what he says next. Do good works. Do what is good. As we are planting, take every opportunity we can to do good. Every chance you have to do good to someone, something, somewhere, some way. Keep proclaiming Jesus when the door of opportunity opens. I have this in front of me that John Wesley had a rule of life. And it went like this. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you can. And that's what it's about being a Christian. The desire to encourage people, the desire to help people, to help, to, the desire to see people grow in Christ, to help those who need help, and to share the good news of Jesus when the door opens. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Matthew 5, 16. It says, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. As we are doing good deeds and doing good work for the Lord, our light shines in the world, people see it, and people want to know why we shine. What makes us light? I had the privilege of being at the state convention on Tuesday, and every session of the convention started with a, a theme, and they had some guest preacher come in, and on Tuesday morning, a man by the name of Walter Belton was the man who took that position to preach a little slight message on the theme. He is pastor of the Word of Change Ministry in Spartanburg. And he tells a story that went something like this. He says, a number of years back, there was a 25-year-old man in jail. 
But there was a certain man that came and visited the jail on a very regular basis. And this 25-year-old man noticed that there was just something different about this man. He had joy in his life. He was happy and he enjoyed sharing and talking to the men there in the jail. And so he said, I have to find out what makes this man so different. And so one day he asked them, he asked this man and the man told him about Jesus. Jesus is what made a difference in his life shared the gospel with this gentleman and this 25 year old man responded and became born again. Reverend Belton said since that 20, day 26 years ago I've had the privilege of telling everyone who will ever listen to me about Jesus just like that man told me that day. He saw Jesus in him. Didn't know who he was. Didn't know why. He was uniquely different. He wanted to know what changed him. What made him that way. His light was shining. Our lights are to shine in our world so people see Jesus. If you notice, he, the last thing he says in this text about doing good is it starts with the household of faith. It starts with our brothers and sisters in Christ. That saying that charity begins at home is pretty much what he's saying here. Our loyalty is to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our, we are a church family. We are a unity, a body of believers. And he says our beginning place to do good is amongst ourselves. When we see a brother or sister in need in this church, we are to do good for them. We are to help them. We are to look for ways, we are literally to look for ways to be a blessing to our brothers and sisters here at Cornerstone. We are to do good. And we are to do it in the name of the Lord. And let's just keep doing good. Let's keep sowing seed. Not be discouraged. Not give up. Ray Kroc, who founded McDonald's, has a, a quote. He says, nothing in this world can take the place of perseverance. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful individuals with talent. He says, genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Perseverance and determination alone are omnipotent. His words. What he was saying, never Give up. Don't quit. Keep on doing good. And someday there will be a harvest. I go back to the Ummels again. I don't know how long they were on the mission field and if they ever saw the end result of their sowing seed. You know, Paul made this statement. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. We don't know when that harvest is going to come in. We don't know what our testimony and what our ministry and how it will touch a person's life. But ultimately, someday there will be a harvest. We might not see it with our own eyes, but God is faithful. If you're here today and you're a Christian, I want to encourage you to keep sowing good seed wherever and whenever you can. Serve the Lord as He has called you. Quite honestly, there are some people in this building today who need to join Cornerstone Baptist Church because God has called you to serve here and to use your gifts and talents at Cornerstone. There could very easily be someone here today that doesn't know Christ as Savior. And the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart of the truth of the Gospel. You've seen it in other people's lives. You, you've seen the, the light shine in a brother or sister in this church family. And the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart that it's time for you to get up and say, I need to be a follower of Jesus. And ask Him for forgiveness and to come into your life as Lord and Savior. That's what needs to be done in your life today. Don't say no to the Lord. Say yes to what He's asking you to do. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the few minutes we've had here today. I ask you to let your spirit move in a real way. Encourage all of us who know you to keep on sowing seed wherever 
you move us and plant us from wherever you want us. Father, if there's an individual here today that knows that they don't know Christ as Savior, Lord, I ask that today be the day you touch their lives so that they truly understand they need to turn to Jesus in faith and repent and receive salvation. We thank you. Help us to honor you. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Let's sing a hymn of invitation, number 470.